Now, it seems to me that COVID-19 is an existential crisis for the global microfinance industry. And I got a lot of pushback by using that language initially uh, because microfinance has had crises before. Uh, and it's come through them, in fact, with flying colors uh, for the most part. But I do believe that this is uh, quantitatively and qualitatively different because uh, this pandemic is affecting both the access to capital for MFIs. Uh, we have seen a greater um, capital flight from developing countries um, than at any time in history, uh, more so than the 2008 financial crisis, more so than the Asian financial crisis. And so the funding environment for MFIs is at risk. Of course, that has happened before at various times. But simultaneously, we're also seeing uh, the revenue for MFIs threatened as their customers uh, are uh, affected by the global macroeconomic collapse, by social distancing, by other um, uh, policies to try and control the pandemic. That means that uh, many MFIs uh, have um, canceled repayments uh, or suspended repayments, and so there's no income coming in. Those MFIs that are funded uh, in part by deposits are seeing those deposits flow out, understandably. And so uh, MFIs are coming under pressure from every direction. And then of course the rescue committees, uh, those multilateral, those government organizations, those multilateral bilateral organizations that have played such a big part in supporting and enabling the microfinance industry are also extremely preoccupied uh, with the health nature and the macro nature of this crisis. And so that means there isn't a whole lot of uh, room to wait and see. Um, we need to be proactive in my opinion. But let's start at the heart of the matter, the impact on poor households. To the extent we care about the impact on global microfinance, uh, it's because we care uh, about those poor households that the industry serves. So uh, to begin with, I think we have to acknowledge there's a great deal of uncertainty remaining about what happens over the next few months in developing countries. Uh, on a variety of dimensions. One, there are reasons to hope that the health impact will be less uh, in developing countries than it has been so far in developed countries, but there are also many reasons to believe that it could be much, much worse. Um, and that includes uh, uh, significant mortality impact for healthcare workers in these countries that will have long-term effects on poor households uh, as their uh, already tenuous access to quality healthcare um, further declines. Now, to get us started in um, that area, I'm going to stop sharing there for a moment uh, and turn to Stuart Rutherford. Stuart is, uh, in, in many ways, the inventor of financial diaries and has been uh, doing something remarkable in Bangladesh, following uh, households in Rishapara daily uh, for, um, I believe it's more than five years now, Stuart. Um, and so I wanted to ask you to start us off grounding us in you know, what we already see happening uh, to these poor households and their incomes. Well, thank you very much, Tim. Yes, that uh, financial diary project that we're doing in central Bangladesh at the moment uh, collects records daily, as you said, of the money transactions made by 60 respondents. And also we collect news about their households. It's been going since 2015, and that means that we can compare their pre-corona lives with their present lives. The, uh, the 60 diaries households are all low income. About a quarter of them are extreme poor, earning and spending less than $2 a day per person. Uh, as of today, none of them have the virus. Nevertheless, the effect of the corona on their lives is severe, and notably, it struck very abruptly. Their lives were turned upside down between the 23rd of March, when the government announced that there would be a national lockdown, and the 26th, when it came into effect. Jobs and micro-businesses disappeared almost overnight, especially for the informal workers who constitute the majority of our diarists. So on the day that the lockdown started, the number of transactions that we record fell from its long-term average of about 500 a day to less than 300 a day, and has stayed down there since. And uh, diarists' income and expenditure 
have both fallen by about two thirds since March 26. You can move on to the next slide, Tim. And uh, you'll see that uh, income has declined somewhat more severely than expenditure. So what's happening to these 60 people? Well, the, the psychological effect is notable. Our diarists are anxious and some of them are really frightened. Some even gave up work opportunities because they're too scared to go out, like a newspaper vendor who stopped buying papers even though they're still available because he doesn't want to be out on the street selling them. He's now growing vegetables in his backyard. Now, we're two weeks on from that uh, calamitous event, and the shock hasn't yet had catastrophic results, like hunger, for example. Our diarists are not yet skipping more meals than usual. Instead, they've tightened their belts. Uh, they now buy only food and medicine, so it helps that the shops where they buy other things are all shut. Even drinking tea and smoking and chewing betel at tea stalls has gone down. So their cash reserves that they keep at home have fallen somewhat less than you might expect. Our poorest diarist, our poorest diarist, for example, who does odd jobs in the food market, gets much less work than she used to, but stallholders give her leftover bits of food. She's cut her spending to below what it used to be, and she's stopped saving. But she knows that if the crisis goes on, much longer, she'll be in big trouble. So what help are they getting? Well, so far, 22 of our 60 diarists have had baskets of basic foods from a government corona-related food relief program, but no one's had any cash relief yet. Other ways of coping haven't really kicked in. We haven't, for example, seen a marked rise in the value of gifts and charity that our diarists get, nor have we seen a rise in informal borrowing, and we haven't yet seen any distressed sales of assets yet. Um, remittance receipts have fallen, remittance, overseas remittance receipts have fallen because many of the family members overseas have lost their jobs. Uh, shop credit is drying up, the use of mobile money, which was never very common anyway amongst our diarists, has shrunk rather than grown. Uh, some of the diarists are drawing down their savings where that's possible, but most of them keep their savings in MFIs, and the MFIs closed on March the 24th. We've not recorded a single MFI transaction since then, whereas normally we see MFI loans issued every few days and repayments and savings almost every day. I think we'll be talking more about MFIs later on. Um, of course, uh, I've been talking about a general picture, but individual diarists are being affected in different ways. For example, one poor diarist lost her job as a maidservant because her employer was scared of being infected by her. But then that employer did get sick and called our diarist back to look after her. A tailor saw his income evaporate overnight, but then he got a big order from the local hospital to make nurses gowns. An orderly at that same hospital gets a monthly government salary. So he's been able to go on spending big money building his new home, just as if nothing whatsoever had changed. So there we are, that's the picture so far. I'll leave it there, Tim, and we can come back for more if we need to at any time. Thanks, Stuart. And, and let me note, um, there are links to many of the things we'll be discussing on the Financial Access uh, blog that you can visit by financialaccess.org. You'll see a link to uh, ongoing posts that Stuart is doing about the Rishapara Diaries, um, as well as uh, there's a similar project uh, that has started back up in Kenya, uh, Julie Zolman leading from the, the Kenya Financial Diaries, and those are being posted at the FSD Kenya site, and you'll find a link to those uh, on 
uh, on the financialaccess.org. And those stories that Stuart has told are largely mirrored in what we, um, are, what Julie is hearing from the, the Kenya diarists. Jonathan, um, you and I were in a conversation quite similar about Pakistan uh, just yesterday on a, a survey of, of borrowers in Pakistan. Yeah, we're seeing something very similar to um, what Stuart's describing. Um, this is work with uh, Kashif Malak, uh, Mohammed Meki, Simon Quinn, and Farah Saeed, where they've been collecting data on um, microfinance borrowers, also loan officers and CEOs. And the situation that Stuart describes with the consequences of the lockdown, together with the collapse of remittances, you know, creating an immediate crisis. What the rapid response data is showing is a collapse in income and a collapse in sales by about 90%. And the biggest concern now is really food shortages. Um, and the biggest need um, is expressed as cash donations. So that's that's the situation. And then you know we can talk about what's happening with the microfinance institutions. Um, but on the ground, it looks a lot like what Stuart's seeing in Bangladesh. Uh, Shamran, you are probably uniquely positioned to see the global effects here because of uh, BRAC's uh, multinational uh, footprint. Um, would you take a few moments to tell, you, tell us about um, what you see happening, uh, not just in South Asia, and, and, uh, but across uh, BRAC's global footprint? How um, common are these stories? Is this what we're seeing everywhere? Thanks a lot, Tim. Yeah, actually, these are, um, you know, these stories are common everywhere. Um, I'll just give you a quick sense of uh, where we are. So we've got microfinance in seven countries, two in uh, West Africa, three in East Africa, and two in South Asia, including, of course, Bangladesh, where we've got our largest operations. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's very similar stories. I mean, obviously, the lockdowns have happened on different dates in, in all of each of the seven countries where we operate, and one or two countries still haven't done a nationwide lockdown, but most have gone into some form of lockdowns. Um, and it's, it's almost exactly what, what Stuart and, and Jonathan have described. As soon as the lockdown happens, you know, immediately you know, the impact starts. Um, I think you and Greta have already written about the fact that the initial and the hardest hit are the informal urban non-agriculture firms. But I mean, with, with the countries where we, we're a couple of weeks into it, it's no longer just in urban areas. I mean, that impact has now gone to rural. Um, and some of the things we've seen also are, you know, I mean, you know, a lot of the urban, uh, you know, the urban informal workers send money home. Uh, they can't send money home. And a lot of them have now gone home, but they, as soon as they get to their villages, the villagers put them in quarantine, right? Because you've come from us outside. So you've got to stay stuck at home for about 14 days. So they can't work. Um, so yeah, all of those issues, of course, in, in certain countries, more than others, remittance is a big, uh, big, um, you know, uh, thing. And that's dried up as well quite a bit. Um, the garments industry in Bangladesh is shut. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty around whether owners will pay wages, uh, even though the government has uh, basically uh, announced a large stimulus package, but that's sort of the, the, the mechanics of that are still being worked out. But yeah, everywhere we, where, where they're going into lockdowns in West Africa, we saw it also in, uh, during the Ebola period. Um, very similar issues and in East Africa, we're seeing similar things and, and also in South Asia. So I'm afraid I don't have, um, you know, anything different to report. Mm. Uh, Shamran, how common uh, are, uh, have you seen that um, MFI branches are being closed? I know I, uh, Greta and I heard some reports that in some countries, regulators determined that MFIs were non-essential services and had to close. Uh, where in others they were considered more banks and allowed to stay open. Um, what's been uh, Brock's experience with, with forcible closures of, of branches? Yeah, good question. And again, it's a mixed bag. Um, so in certain markets where we're depositing MFIs um, and or even sort of banks like in, in Uganda, for example, we're a tier two bank. Um, we've been asked to keep our branches open for our clients to be, uh, to, uh, be able to get their savings if they want to come and uh, get some savings out. Similarly in Rwanda, uh, but then in Bangladesh where we have the largest operations and where we've got a lot of borrower deposits, um, we're having to negotiate with, with both local authorities and regulators to say at least we've got to be able to uh, refund deposits at this time. And, and as I think both of my 
previous speakers suggested. I mean, the need of the hour is cash. Uh, that's something also we're seeing everywhere. Um, and we need to get cash into the hands of people. I mean, the, the village kitchen markets are still open so they can go out and buy food. They just don't have income right now. So if we can, at least in places where we're deposit taking, if we can open that up and, and give and let our clients uh, come in and get some of their savings from us and that, that could at least tide them over for a little bit. So that needs to be open and not everywhere are we being able to keep our branches open even to do that. Um, Greta, let me turn to you because uh, you know our, our blog post kicked off a series of conversations uh, with MFIs uh, and others. Um, could you you know talk about what you are uh, are hearing in those conversations from uh, MFI leaders about uh, you know this issue of do we try to stay open? How do we work with regulators? Do we have access to regulators to even have these conversations? Yeah, um, thanks, Tim, and good morning, good evening, good afternoon to all of you. Um, you know, we've spoken with a number of MFIs um, in the last couple of weeks um, who have operations covering Africa, Latin America, Europe, and Asia. Um, and you know, the situation is still fairly heterogeneous, um, but you know, there are some common strands through it. So in basically what we're hearing is that they're hunkering down and getting ready for the storm or dealing with the storm already. And, you know, varying degrees of either sort of suspending or adapting operations really depending on the situation in each country. Um, so, you know, a lot of them are starting with protecting their customers and staff, um, finding ways to limit face-to-face -face interactions. Obviously group meetings become really challenging in this environment. Um, educating staff, implementing work from home, um, limiting branch hours. In some cases, branches are being closed, but otherwise they are limiting branch hours to essential needs like deposit withdrawals. Um, driving more through digital where that's possible. So we're seeing, you know, people trying to drive transactions on the phone, being able to roll over loans remotely, um, really activating call centers, leaning on agents. Um, and they're really proactively engaging with customers and um, ensuring that their loan officers are, you know, in a steady state. They're, you know, managing their, their own lives, but maintaining contact with customers as well. You know, we're seeing active emergency planning, so commu regular communications with staff and shareholders, with regulators, um, bolstering risk management practices, appointing crisis managers, um, you know, just business continuity plans across the board. Of course, they are getting in touch with both their creditors, shareholders, and the regulators. So, you know, from a financial point of view, what Shamron said is exactly right. Everybody's maximizing cash, pulling back um, sharply on lending, looking at grace periods, restructuring, stress testing their portfolios, um, working with their creditors to figure out how they're going to ride out the crisis together. There are some concerns, for example, about um, FX volatility um, and, and expectations that that's going to continue. And, you know, the messaging we're getting on the investment side is that so far, at least international um, creditors have been pretty accommodating. Uh, but it's also unclear how long they're going to be able to do that. So, you know, as we see non-payments happening at the bottom of the chain, it's going to flow through to the top of the chain and put strain on the system all the way through. And, you know, I don't think any of us have had to deal with a crisis that's happening everywhere at once. Um, and so, you know, the MIVs are kind of the first um, line of defense in some of this. Um, but then, you know, the DFIs are starting to mobilize because the, the MIVs are not going to have as much um, road to run as, as the DFIs. And, you know, eventually we may need donors to step in. We are hearing people saying that there are differences in their conversations between international creditors and, and local investors. And that, you know, may play out differently in different markets. Mm -hmm. uh, and then finally, just, you know, conversations with regulators. And here is where we're getting messaging that is really, really different. Um, regulators are reacting very differently. Um, you know, so one MFI that we spoke with said that, you know, they've seen reactions from very proactive to absolutely nothing. Um, you know, and in some cases, we're seeing forbearance measures put in place for borrowers, but really no thought of relief to MFIs. MFI is not really being part of any sort of safety net that regulators are putting in place because they're all focused on on their banking system. Um, we've even heard in one case that, you know, the government is actually putting caps on interest rates to basically the cost of funds for MFIs, but that's not being applied for the overall banking sector. So some even unevenness in, in response as well. Um, we are seeing the relaxation of ratios in some markets, but in others, this is overlooked. Um, 
and, and then we see some regulators who are actually planning forward, right? So really thinking ahead towards what is likely to play out, um, planning for consolidation. Um, you know, we've seen some references um, to resources being put in place, in fact, for bailouts and, and mergers and acquisitions and, and trying to figure out how to manage some of the, the pain that is probably going to come. Um, we've seen MFIs trying to come together as an industry and advocate, but of course they have far less weight than the banking sector does. And you know, in some cases, we see you know MFIs just being completely ignored by um, governments as countries are are rushing to manage a much larger crisis. So you know, it's heterogeneous, but we're seeing the same effects as others have um, remarked on across the board. And and you know, it, it's going to be different how this plays out um, over time. And you know, time is a big factor in this. How long this lasts, I think, is going to be a really important element. Uh, and we just don't know. And so I think there, you know, people are are trying to figure out how to write it out. We can draw on some lessons of the past, but you know, this is a pretty different crisis than we faced before. Uh, Ms. Shaman, your, um, uh, you know, BRAC with its footprint in different banks in different places, I expect you're seeing some of these different reactions, both from uh, funders, um, how you're dealing with uh, depositors and, and withdrawing funds and the outflow of, from, of savings deposits, dealing with regulators. Could you talk uh, some about what how BRAC is, is seeing the different approaches in different places and uh, how that's affecting um, how you're, you're managing your operations. Yeah, thanks a lot. So yeah, again, I would say some things are very common and some things are very different. So one thing that's common that Greta has mentioned is we haven't yet seen any sort of um, anything from regulators or governments in terms of stimulus or, or, or support for the microfinance industry. It's as if, you know, we don't exist. Everything is to sort of um, banks, um, in the case of Bangladesh, it's to the, to the ready-made garments industry. Um, there's even talk of getting money into the hands of SMEs, but how they're going to do that, uh, if it's not through us, I don't know. Uh, so yeah, that's common. But yeah, um, generally, if, you, if we look at our seven countries of operations, yeah, there, is, there have been some differences. And, and it's some of it's, uh, so for example, if you look at Rwanda, where President Kagame basically went very early and, and put the country on lockdown, we had that at one end. And then on the, at the other end, we've got, uh, we've got Tanzania, which is next door, which is still operating. So our, our MFI in Tanzania is still actually being able to transact, do, lay, do dis disbursements and installment collections, even though we've put it under, I mean, we, we're doing very limited transactions at this time. Um, and of course, we're trying to uh, ensure that we protect our staff. So we've, we've got a lot of social distancing protocols and even cash and the way we transact and all of that in. So yeah, so you've got those two, right? Uh, which are next door to each other, very different. Uh, in a place like Rwanda, when they, when, they say, when they say lockdown, they mean lockdown. So you can't even go out. I mean, even if you're going out to buy groceries, you'll get stopped three times and you have to explain um, where you're going and whether you really need to go or not. So yeah, there, there are those differences. In certain markets, we haven't, uh, in certain markets, for example, this, the regulator have said to us that we'd like you to suspend collections for now, right? Uh, it, it, nowhere yet ha have we had a situation where the regulator has basically said, says, you know, this is an order, but in certain markets, the regulators have said that. But even if we weren't, I mean, even if the regulator doesn't say that, in effect, that's what's happening when you've got a country in lockdown, because people can't travel, people can't go to branches. So, so for example, with the, with the savings uh, example I was giving, in, in, no, in none of our markets are we now, have we been asked not to refund savings to our depositors, except that we can't open branches because our staff can't go to branches, our depositors can't come to branches. Um, and so even if we want to give it, we've got to figure out, so we're, for example, we're looking at, for example, digital financial services, uh, the, you know, I mean, how many of our clients have mobile money accounts? Can we give refund savings through that? We're looking at some of that, but you know, the, the very logistical issues where you've got lockdowns makes it very difficult. And also in countries where the country is not under lockdown, there are parts of the country that are under lockdown. And those are the parts where the need is the most. So if mm -hmm. I look at Liberia, it's the main two you know, counties around Monrovia, Monserrado and Margibi, which are under lockdown. And that's where people are suffering. That's where we need to get cash out. And that's where nobody can go anywhere. So it's the same, you, you know, so um, it's the same as a, as a nationwide lockdown. So, so basically those are, you know, um, again, we're facing some of that. Uh, and trying to see how much we can do working with regulators and uh, governments and even local administration to say, look, can you can we find a way to drift get cash to to people? 
I mean, there is some, um, you know, uh, it's not that, I mean, people realize, and governments are realizing that this is, this is a need. Uh, they're figuring out how to balance between social distancing and keeping people home and getting them cash. And, as, and I think the main thing to say is it's very, very slow uh, now. I mean, we need to move a lot faster. Um, and we're not moving nearly fast enough on this. So I, I want to pivot there um, because there's an obvious um, connection to digital financial services and, and mobile money. Um, and, you know, Stuart, you had referenced earlier that you're actually seeing mobile money transactions decline uh, rather than an increase. Um, you know, I, I had some speculation uh, in the five last week about the uncertainty about what this will do to digital financial services because um, th they are as varied country to country and even within uh, country uh, as MFIs. Uh, you know, for instance, I have a hard time believing that many of the digital lenders that have cropped up over the last few years are going to survive because I have a hard time believing anybody's going to prioritize repaying those loans or any funder is going to prioritize bailing out those folks. At the same time, it seems like mobile money could be a really uh, important and we, it, this could be the paradigm that gets us out of cash in cash out. But then at the same time, we have this issue that you still need to get cash in in the first place. And in many places, the, the agents are, uh, whether they are de deemed essential services or not, local authorities are closing the shops in which the agents work. And so, uh, 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 and then we also, I guess, supposed to should be concerned that, that mobile money agents or ultimately loan officers serve as super spreaders. If they're gonna be the people handling a lot of cash talking to a lot of people. Um, uh, Greta, Shamran, um, comments, thoughts on that? Oh, I have many comments on that. Um, do you know, I, I think one of the things that we're gonna see is that this will play out really differently depending on the starting point of the country, right? So you may see in a Kenya where they were already moving towards merchant payments, you know, uh, over time an increase in people transacting digitally and that being truly digital. But I think for the most part, we have to remember that, you know, mobile money is based on massive cash in cash out infrastructure. So it is just as face to face as anything else, right? And, and, you know, in countries that don't have that infrastructure, we're seeing a lot of wishful thinking about how easy that's going to be to build under the current circumstances, right? We're going to get government to person payments out to everybody and magically we're going to assume that this distribution infrastructure exists overnight. Or we're seeing countries that have good distribution in infrastructure, but they're trying to drive down, you know, they're, they're zero rating P2P rates. They're trying to zero rate cash out, which actually, you know, harms the very people who are doing those cash out transactions. So we're seeing policy responses that aren't very cognizant of how cash in cash out works. So I, I think we can imagine in some places we'll see possibly an acceleration, but I think for the most part, it's gonna be really difficult. Even in an established mobile money operation, doing cash out at a massive level is gonna really challenge liquidity management practices. And, and it's not gonna be any different than you know just shoveling money out the doors. In Lebanon, we know that you know the army's being mobilized to get cash out to people, right? And so I think, it's not going to be the panacea that a lot of people think, but it, it's likely to play out in different ways, different places. Um, Shamaran, before I turn to you on that, I'll just note, uh, Graham Wright from MSC is on the line. Uh, Graham, I'm going to give you an advance warning. I'm going to turn on your mic in a minute just to see if you have something to add to this, because MSC is often who I turn to for understanding the, the, the operational side of digital financial services and what's really happening. So, um, uh, Shamran, uh, what are you seeing in terms of digital financial services in your markets? No, exactly. I mean, I, I, I don't know what to add to what Greta just said. All, I mean, all of the above, right? So, yeah, I mean, some of the, some of the things we're seeing, for example, with Bcash in Bangladesh, um, obviously, uh, you know, challenges around managing liquidity with agents. A lot of the agent shops are now shutting down. And, and you know, things are changing very fast. So, you know, even ones that were open last week and still transacting are not anymore. I mean, people are take, getting more and more worried as the number of infections and confirmed cases go up. So uh, similarly, I mean, I think, you know, Stuart, if you see your Rishikara diaries, diaries, I think you'll see an even sharper drop um, in transactions like this week onwards as, as because the last few days, the infections have gone up a lot. Yeah. And then of course the government's come in and said, you've got to do, uh, we've got to do free cash outs and <laughs> not the most important thing right now. Um, so, yeah, I mean, all of those things, I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, you know, the whole cash distribution, uh, cash management issues is going to be, get very challenging now. 
and, uh, and, and and the things that regulators are doing are not necessarily helpful at this time. Yes, that's that's quite right, uh, Samra, on them. Uh, I've just been looking at the late, very latest data that's come in from Rishipara the last two days, and uh, things have got worse in the last two days. It's absolutely true, and life is getting harder for the money manager, uh, mobile money agents. They're now uh, not really being allowed where we are to open after 11 o'clock in the morning, and even in that small early morning window, they are being increasingly harassed by the police and so on. So it's, uh, it does, I agree with you, it does look as if it's getting worse. While I'm on that subject, there is one thing about the psychology of our diaries, which I think is interesting, which is that, surprising to me, more of their anxiety seems to be about catching the virus than about their own uh, livelihoods. And I think, judging from some of the conversations we've had with them, one of the reasons for that is that they hear that these lockdowns are time limited. So they've all taken it for granted. Oh, this, this is going to stop on, first of all, it was you know, April the 1st, and then it was April the 14th. It's probably going to be extended again. But they, a lot of them believe that it's going to stop soon, so it doesn't matter. All we've got to do is tighten our belts for another week or so, and everything will go back to normal. So I think that's one of the reasons why there's less expressed anxiety about their livelihoods than I expected, and more expressed anxiety about the disease itself. Um, Graham, I, I have uh, unmuted you. Uh, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Um, any quick comments you'd like to add on sort of the D DFS side of things? Um, yeah, a couple. And uh, what we're saying is um, we're working with Caribou Digital on this. And um, what we're seeing is the, the value of transactions. And I'm talking about Kenya, but I think this, um, this may extend elsewhere. The value has gone up, um, but the volume has come down. And um, with the volume, the commissions have come down for agents uh, significantly, and agents are beginning to struggle. So overall, there's a reduction in the use of mobile money. Um, agents are suffering. And I worry that this may actually be, um, if, if agents are suffering in Kenya, which is sort of the epicenter of uh, mobile money um, and the most developed market, if they're suffering there, Lord only knows what's happening in less developed markets, because I think there's a very real risk. Indeed, we've talked to a couple of agents who are either scaling back their liquidity and or planning to shut because they need the money that is currently sitting in their liquidity reserves to feed their family. Thanks for that, Graham. Um, yeah, I think this is indicative of there are no easy solutions here. There are no magic bullets. Everything that we do is, you know, why this is an existential crisis that I think has the possibility to radically reshape the industry is because there is no channel that's working well um, that can sort of come to the rescue of these other parts. Every piece of the, the ecosystem is being affected, and affected in, in meaningful ways. And there's still a lot of uncertainty about what happens next. But I want to turn there now to like, what do we do about all of this? Um, and, you know, because uh, of who we are, uh, our focus is on the microfinance industry. Um, Neville, can you talk a little bit about um, what Kiva is doing um, with the networks that, that you have to, you know, try and provide some support for, for MFIs uh, who are seeing these operational challenges, both on the funding side and on the repayment side? Yeah, sure. Thank you. So yeah, so we, we work with 200 MFIs in 70 countries. So they have a combined balance sheet of about $5 billion. So we have a very kind of broad um, relationship with MFI partners around the world. And of course, traditionally, Kiva.org crowdfunding platform, we funded loans to end users through the MFIs. What we've seen in the past week is a 40% decline in new loans being co posted to Kiva.org for all of the reasons that the the you know, folks on the, this call have talked about. And what, what we're realizing very quickly is that the, the MFIs themselves are, can, are, are fragile. So we're, we're shifting our attention uh, immediately 
to actually lending to the MFIs, so balance sheet lending to MFIs. I'll talk about a couple of different solutions here, but we're aiming to fund from our balance sheet and from Kiva.org to get you know, some tens of millions of dollars out over the next few weeks to the MFIs that are most at risk here to, to get them shored up. Um, and at a, you know, at a 0%, couple of percent interest rate with a six to nine month grace period, a couple of year working capital loan. That seems to be like a very constructive thing to do. And then behind that, we're aiming over, over the next 90 days to raise 100 million, 200 million dollars, maybe of funding to, to go to these MFIs, for the MFIs themselves. And I think as other people have noted, that's, it's not clear that that kind of support is coming from other places. And because we've already, we've done the diligence, we've worked with these MFIs, we're well positioned to be able to step into that role. So that, that's one role we're trying to play on the um, shoring up the balance sheet and operations. And then the, and, and, and of course, to the benefit of keeping them in business so they can ultimately you know, be, be a benefit to the Envara. And then the second thing we're doing in Sierra Leone, um, we deployed a nation scale digital identity system for, for EKYC, ultimately that project was about getting access to finance and credit, but we're, we're, talk, we're work, talking with the government, working with the government there to about whether we can use that for um, track and trace um, for, for COVID response. Because obviously a digital identity system for you know, tracing money is quite, quite, quite applicable to also you know, being a benefit in this situation. And we think we can actually get the systems sort of refactored for that in a few weeks. And then, and then more broadly on our digital identity initiative, we're, we're, we would love to really rapidly step up the global rollout of that, but not only for the, for the medical use as well as our initial you know, credit use, but also um, as we're coming with digital finance for, for government to person transfer and for you know, some kind of UBI and direct cash transfer. We think that by getting everyone a secure digital identity, that can radically speed up and ease and lower the cost of that as well. So those are the couple of things that we're working on right now. Um, thanks for that, Neville. And you've, you've hinted there on a couple of themes that I hope we get to spend some time on here, uh, which is alternative sources of funding, alternative approaches to the problem, but also some different things that, that perhaps the MFI industry could be doing given the infrastructure that it does have uh, to be able to to respond to the overall crisis, um, if we can get past just the basic survival questions. But uh, here, I, I want to stick to the basic survival questions because um, many MFIs are going to face, if they are not already facing, a liquidity crunch. Uh, many of them are about to blow through all of their covenants for, for their funding uh, in terms of uh, loans going into default or capital adequacy ratios. Um, Deborah, I want to bring you into the conversation. I appreciate your your um, your patience here as uh, sort of we've, we've covered some of the, the groundwork, but um, you were very involved in helping uh, work out uh, debt to MFIs during the 2008 financial crisis. Um, and uh, on our website, financialaccess.org, you can see there's a post that uh, we worked with on Deborah, um, some papers that she worked on and some, some lessons from that. But I'm hoping you can uh, provide a quick overview of, of, of that work and your thoughts on what needs to happen here. And in particular, you know, to the extent that uh, anybody would ever listen to me, the one thing I have proposed as an immediate uh, fast action is that there should be a global mo moratorium on liquidity flowing out of MFIs. All lenders to MFIs should just go on standstill to allow MFIs to maintain liquidity as we figure out what's the right next step and what's the best next step. Um, I'd love for you, your comments on, on that idea as well as uh, what you learned from 2008 and what you think needs to happen now. Right. Thank you very much. And I'm, uh, I'm very honored to be part of this conversation and, and the stories that we're hearing are very concerning. So um, what I've been looking at and thinking about in the context of what we did in 2008 and where we are now is to really think about the extent to which how can we shape investor behavior so that that behavior is aligned with um, MFIs that are working to support their clients. Um, and, and I think one of the things we learned from 2008 was the importance of developing norms um, and, and processes of behavior that we would expect to see from investors uh, so that they were all pulling in the same direction. Um, as everyone has said, this is a different crisis. Uh, in 2008, 
it was primarily a financial crisis um, that led to refinancing risk, liquidity risk, and in some cases, insolvency. And those types of risk revealed operational risk of MFIs, but it didn't necessarily trigger the operational risk. That is, we saw who was actually having some operational problems, but had been able to mask it because they had uh, significant influxes of funding. Here, we're seeing a very different situation, which is, yes, that probably is going to happen too. But we're also, as you heard today, we're seeing the risks that are bubbling up from the very fact that the clients are having trouble. They are not as insulated from this uh, crisis as they were in the financial crisis. And so we are, as everyone's saying, and I'm just going to repeat a few things because I think it's important when I take you to where I think we should be going. You know, when you see runs on deposits, not just on loans, um, you know, a question I would have uh, back to Jim is, uh, you know, are you also then going to put a freeze on deposits? I mean, that. You know, I say we have to really be very thoughtful about uh, where we ex where we think money should stop flowing and where we think money should start flowing. Um, I don't think that uh, I think those funding streams are hugely important right now. I don't think they're the only answer. Um, so let me just say a couple things about 2008 that I think would be uh, helpful. Um, one is, let me give a nod to Joan Trant and what at the time was the International Association of Microfinance Institutions that gathered a bunch of creditors together um, to really think through what would be appropriate behavior and actually to put together some principles for how they should operate um, with the idea that everyone was hoping to use voluntary debt workout principles instead of looking at the more uh, formal court administered um, in or insolvency and bankruptcy proceedings. Uh, voluntary debt restructuring and workout principles have one thing that we all I think are calling for, uh, which is speed. Um, and that's important. Um, uh, and I think it's where we would want to go. I don't think we're in a situation where you can really expect that you're going to get a lot of attention from your insolvency and bankruptcy provisions. So we are in, a, I think, a voluntary workout situation. And those principles for creditor coordination, shared goals, uh, uh, standstills were, were appropriate, um, really looking at what are the uh, goals of a restructuring were very important. There was transparency, there was uh, fair and good faith dealings, speedy and simple solutions, favoring new money over old. So as I hear about Kiva, one thing I would immediately say is I hope that, um, that Kiva's new funding would have priority over those who had put money in when things were still good. I mean, we don't want to penalize those that are mobilizing liquidity facilities right now when they're lending into a very risky situation. Um, my big thing that I've been thinking about is we didn't use the full tools in the toolbox in 2008. We didn't have to. Uh, people tended to do more rescheduling of interest and principal, extending the terms, reducing the rates. Um, uh, you didn't have a lot of, of more, how can I say, deeper solutions. And I'm, look, I'm thinking about Greta's comment. We don't know the duration of this. We don't know yet even the depth of this, although it looks horrible. Um, and so I think we have to quickly start to think about longer term uh, solutions and use a broader menu of options. Understanding that in fact, the while the processes that we may want to be supporting need to be consistent, again, to shape behavior, um, reward those behaviors we like, uh, uh, shame and name those behaviors we don't. Um, I think we also need to think about very uh, giving people room to develop solutions that are responsive to the particular situation, both the country level and also the MFI level. So a couple things that were not used as much in 2008 that I think is really important now is to think about not just extending debt terms, but reducing debt terms. Um, you know, there could be cash uh, buybacks of debt. There could be debt exchanges for new types of claims. Um, I'm almost even thinking that it's time for what I would call a um, micro Brady plan, whereby um, uh, institutions like the World Bank and some of our other iffies and diffies step in and say, look, 
uh, if you reduce your claims on these MFIs, we will give you a new instrument that is backed by collateral that we are holding for you. So you don't have to think about the collateral of the clients, which is what the secured creditors and the MFIs have done to date. That's not the direction I think we want to go. I think we need a secondary market. We need to allow those, um, those investors who have to exit because of other reasons, perhaps they are closed in fund and they, and they um, don't have a lot of flexibility. We need to find a way for them to get out um, uh, of the transactions, but in a way that doesn't necessarily penalize uh, the MFI. So a secondary market of trading and instruments, I think is a smart idea. All of which is to say, I think we have to think about this differently than we did in 2008, more comprehensively, and really start to reimagine more tools for the toolbox. This is not simply a liquidity fund uh, answer. That is an important part of it, but it can't be the only part. Thanks, Deborah. You know, Jonathan, one of the things we've talked about is sort of um, heterogeneity in how this is affecting different countries and uh, affecting different parts of the industry. But uh, you know, the MFI industry is pretty varied. And one of the big questions here is uh, what's going to happen with the, uh, the nonprofits, the NBFIs, the ROSCAs, the cooperatives? Uh, are they going to get access? Um, you, you've done some work on, on who gets served by which different types of uh, of institutions, um, do you have worries about uh, the the institutions that serve more women, that serve more rural customers, that serve poorer customers being left behind in these conversations? Yeah, it's it's a great question, and I was just thinking about that as I was listening to Deborah, um, who you know I, I think these ideas that Deborah's putting forward are really essential, and yet my question is like, which institutions are they? really addressing. You know, when we um, when the surveys were done in Pakistan, you know, it becomes clear you've got some institutions which are really charitable, which may not even be charging interest in the context in Pakistan, maybe zero interest loans supported by um, charity. You've got some which are supported by international financial institutions. So they're non-bank financial institutions rather than uh, commercial microfinance banks. So they may be charging 20, 30% on loans. And then you've got you know, some charging as much as 60%, much more commercial, um, and perhaps much more like um, the kinds of institutions um, that, that Deborah may be um, sort of thinking about. I'm not sure. The institutions that are NGOs and MBFIs are the ones that tend to be the ones really focused on women, focused on lower income um, households, really um, embracing um, more fully the developmental charitable nature of an important part of what microfinance is all about. And so you know, we've talked about differences across countries because of regulatory environments, but within countries, there are also huge differences. Um, and some of these institutions regulated very differently from others. I really do worry a lot that we're gonna put a lot of attention into how to work these things out vis-a-vis -vis international investors when there are millions and millions, tens of millions of microfinance customers who are among the most vulnerable, who are really not part of that equation. Jonathan, I imagine, and Deborah, you uh, or Greta may know more about this, but um, part of the issue for some of these different parts of the industry is who they're borrowing from, whether they're able to borrow in local currency whether they're borrowing in hard currencies, whether they're able to hedge currency risk. Um, we're seeing some pretty large volatility in foreign exchange markets. Uh, I read a post this morning from Brookings about acting now to present, prevent a replay of the Asian financial crisis as uh, uh, currencies in a number of Southeast Asian countries have already fallen by about 20% in relation to the dollar. Um, how big of a threat is the foreign exchange risk and, and Deborah, you know, thoughts on, are, are there specific steps that can be taken now to cushion foreign exchange risk as just another sort of layer on top of this? 
So let me first say, in response to Jonathan, I absolutely agree. I think that, um, as I said, I think while we can develop some principles for how we will act and what we want to see happen within this field, the, the responses need to be tailored very much to the institution. So I, I'm with you, Jonathan, on this. Um, and as a result, as you're pointing out, um, and Tim is as well, uh, the sources of the funding is one lever that we have. And, and so for those that are funded by um, in, uh, investors, uh, then you can shape investor behavior. For those that are more donor and grant supported, that's where you'd want to focus your attention. Uh, one thing that we did directly to your point, uh, Tim, uh, in, uh, I was very involved in the sovereign debt restructuring crisis of the 80s and into the 90s. Um, is that you actually did at times, uh, which was ex it was essentially a foreign exchange crisis too, right? These were the, usually it was the dollar debt or hard currency debt of countries that was in trouble, um, and and there were some very creative new tools um, put together where in fact uh, some uh, of the hard currency financing uh, was converted into local currency. I mean there are things one can do. Uh, uh, to try to minimize some of the foreign exchange risk. Um, and so that would be something I think should be on the table um, uh, as we think about how to, you know, they, even with uh, local currency though, uh, loans, uh, there's, this is still going to be a problem, right? Uh, uh, because the, uh, the, the assets that are local currency denominated are going to, even that is going to face portfolio uh, risk. It's not just those MFIs that have been lending in dollars to their clients. Um, um, so I think this is a, an issue that goes beyond just the currency in which the, the outside funding has come in. So I'm going to uh, pause here to say we're obviously going to go a little bit longer than 10 o'clock here. Greta, I know that uh, you uh, have a hard stop at some point coming up, but I want to move to sort of a more general conversation around, um, you know, what this means for the industry and for MFIs in particular. Uh, and while I'm, uh, I'm asking a question, Shamar, I'm gonna start with you and then uh, Nev will ask you to comment as well. Uh, during that process, uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Michael Schlein, who's on the line, I think he's still there, uh, to join as well, and Barbara Mignoni uh, from uh, EA Consultants, who uh, has unusual insight into the situation in Latin America. Uh, I'm gonna invite them both in. Hopefully they'll be able to participate with us. Uh, on this question of, you know, what does this mean, the uncertainty, uh, you know, for MFIs and how they operate? Um, you know, one of the great victories of the global microfinance movement has been uh, generating a whole bunch of uh, trust uh, among clients. Uh, have these institutions that are rules-based, that you know if you do X, then they will do Y, and not everything is a negotiation or a relationship. Um, in an environment where so much is changing and we have questions, you know, uh, some politician may tell, just start telling people to stop repaying. Some MFIs will suspend payments and others will not. Some will accrue interest and others will not. Um, there's, there's potential for massive confusion and, and clearly some issues um, potentially for uh, shall we say, rogue loan officers who are worried about their jobs, whose uh, uh, their income is dependent on incentives like repayment rates. Um, how are you thinking about managing uh, the trust issues that come along with your relationships with, with customers? Uh, and Neville, in your case, sort of working with the MFIs that you support. And, you know, I know Kiva has uh, long had standards for the behavior of the MFIs in your network. Um, and uh, uh, Shamran, I'll start with you there um, and then uh, turn to you, Neville, and in the meantime, uh, open the line for Michael and Barbara. Yeah, thanks again, Tim. So I think um, obviously there are things we don't know. The main thing I think, as uh, both Deborah and Greta have said, is that we don't know how long this will last. And, and that uncertainty is obviously quite, um, you know, quite severe. But, but I think, you know, I've been thinking a lot in the last couple of weeks about uh, what happened with our Ebola situation in, in West Africa, just to stay positive or through this through this crisis. Because in, in, in West Africa, when we've got operations in Liberia and Sierra Leone, and when Ebola hit, uh, we had to again suspend operations. And it was 
very regionalized, but very similar in certain ways because there was social distancing. Countries had all countries in the region, Guinea, Liberia, Sierra Leone had, had basically closed their borders and there wasn't much going on. And our operations had been suspended for seven months uh, before we reopened. Um, and when we did, um, we found that we were able to get back on our feet a lot quicker than we had imagined because for those seven months when the crisis was on, we didn't ask for repayments. We, we continued to communicate with our clients. We continued to pay staff salaries. Uh, and so there was a loyalty from our staff. And, and when we went back out to the field and spoke to our clients, they, 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 tried, they tried to get back uh, into sort of paying back regularly. It takes a little bit of time. And obviously, we've got to, ex we've got to expect that. Uh, so, I, you know, so in my sort of optimistic view, there is a point where this ends and we, we get back to transacting with our clients and, and we're, we're able to, and there's, they start paying back. Obviously, it'll take time. One of the things we will need to do is go back out and, and, and refinance our clients. We need to start disbursing again. That's very, very important, right? We've got to get money back into, into the hands of our clients. The, the, the shorter this is and the faster we can do that, the, 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 the shorter the recovery period will be. If this takes a long time, the recovery period will be also long at the end of this. Um, I think it's very important for us as MFIs to be able to, to stay with our clients at this time. I've been saying this in a couple of other webinars that I've done that you know, very important to keep communicating, not worry about, uh, about uh, collections at this time. I think uh, whether we like it or not, more or less collections have dried up, whether we've suspended operations or not. Um, to the extent possible, we should try to refund deposits, but I know there's going to be a liquidity problem there. And, and we're facing that as well, because we don't have any installments coming in. We've got a certain amount of liquidity. And if savings start going out, uh, we, there's going to be an issue. So we're also trying to figure out how we work with our clients to say, who are the clients who are in real need? Um, and we can give them some of their deposits back uh, and try to, try to manage it. You know? And it's not easy, but we're trying to do that as well. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's that for me, you know, continuing to pay salaries for our staff and keep communicating with our clients through this crisis uh, is important. And that hopefully will allow us to, to come out of this. But absolutely, I don't want to repeat everything that Deborah said, has said and or what Jonathan has said, but all of those things we will need. Uh, we are a nonprofit um, uh, MFI. We do reach a lot of very poor people, mostly women in, in very, very remote areas in West Africa and East Africa and South Asia. Um, but there is another element, sorry, I just one last thing. In addition to international debt, we also borrow a lot from local commercial banks. And that's also one element we've got to think about. Um, in some markets, we've got quite a lot of exposure there as well. Uh, and, and, you know, this global moratorium that you're talking about, Tim, um, even if all the DFIs and the MIVs and the international lenders do that, unless we get some, something similar, get relief also from our local lenders, um, you know, we, we're going to have some issues there as well. So we've got to look at this, you know, overall. But I'll stop there. And let right. Michael come Thank you. Michael. Uh, Neville, um, your thoughts on Sorry. your communications with the MFIs that are in your network on how they are responding and the possibility of, you know, coordinating. You know, we talked about coordinating the behavior of the, the lenders to the MFIs, you know, coordinating for good behavior and practice for the MFIs and how they're interacting with clients. Yeah, I mean, I think some people have said, I'll just sort of re reiterate this. It, it's very different by different markets. You know, when we look at our MFI partners in the Philippines, relative to Kenya, relative to Palestine, relative to Lebanon, the challenges are just different. This isn't sort of a, a I mean, there are some same characteristics, but the regulation, the liquidity requirement, whether it's a bigger, more established MFI or a much smaller, more charitable MFI, it's just, it's just quite, quite different. So... You know, I, I think our response to this, when we think about putting a, a pool of capital together and deploying that capital, one of the things we think about is maximum um, flexibility and tailoring. I mean, it's just a realization that what, what's going to work here and what's going to be of most benefit in one place is, is different to the other. And this kind of monolithic approach um, is going to could have some quite, you know, some quite bad unintended consequences. Not, not that anyone here is proposing that, but that's more of our own realization. But that's also coupled with the challenge of there isn't freedom of movement in many countries now, you know, so we can't get investment managers onto the ground. And even where we have, you know, people who are local, they can't, they don't have freedom of movement in the country. So the, the, the challenge, you know, very pragmatically 
the challenge is one, to get a pool of money together, maintain maximum flexibility around it, try and understand the best situation, but doing that without, you know, the usual process of being able to just sit down and say, okay, you know, let's sit down and thrash this out for, for the day. So, you know, so I, I think that that's where we are. It is a, a highly challenging situation. There's the potential to deploy capital in ways that are, that are not helpful or, or not optimal. So, you know, that, that, that's why I think we just need a very flexible approach for different institutions in different situations. And what's needed a month from now could be quite different than what's needed from today as well. So that's what we're trying to work through. Uh, Michael, thanks for being willing to jump on here at a moment's notice. Um, you know, Axion has a global network. Um, uh, what are you thinking about in terms of how you coordinate responses? How different is it country to country? Or are there some sort of global principles? Uh, and are you hopeful that we can do some collective action things here for the industry to, uh, to help it survive? So uh, first of all, happy to join in. This is great that you pulled this together. Uh, I, I have to say just, um, um, I, I do, I'm, I'm rather pessimistic. I thought uh, Stuart's comment earlier that clients are viewing this as a short-term thing and therefore um, they, they, they think it'll all bounce back. I think regulators are doing the same thing. And I think that's, um, if you think this is a two month problem, you manage it one way. If you think this is a 12 month problem or an 18 month problem, you completely think of it differently. I think collectively people are being very short sighted. That's, that's, that's my personal relatively negative view. Um, one point in the other direction, uh, um, China obviously led this and China in some ways is, is bouncing back. And uh, one of our partners in China, we, we had a, a webinar like this uh, the other day, already 95% um, of their clients are resuming activities. So they are bouncing back. I actually think that China is an exception and not a model for so many reasons, but the government can do there, many other governments can't do. And the digital infrastructure is so much further along than, uh, than other places. I, I think that that's, that's optimistic and I think it will not be the model. I think this whole conversation, appropriately so, is focused on um, microfinance institutions and the economic impact. I think this conversation is gonna feel very, very different. I'm in New York, we're in the uh, epicenter of the crisis right now. I think the epicenter is going to be moving to Mumbai and Lagos in, in a very short amount of time. And I think when, when the disease is, 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 is more, is hitting the emer emerging markets, this, this whole conversation is gonna uh, feel different. I personally, on the regulatory side, I, I, again, I think the regula regula regulators are uh, dealing with this very differently in very different places. I do think the microfinance institutions are being overlooked. I think the, um, um, and I do think that what we need to do, and maybe this, this phone call can be the start of it, is I think we need to collectively appeal to governments to not overlook this sector. I think uh, in times of crisis, they focus on the banks. And I think we are globally an enormous, you know, our clients are the most vulnerable in the world. And I think they're sort of not paying attention to us. And I, I think we need to change that. Um, last thought, um, among investors, uh, I, I, we've had a lot of conversations and, and, and Greta has really been trying to pull this together into a more collective action. Um, I think there's a willingness because there is a collective, um, Microfinance is a community, it's a movement, but I do think investors, not a surprise, are first and foremost focused on their own portfolio. And I think it's gonna be hard to break that and uh, get them to an industry-wide solution. Um, so I, I'll, I'll stop there, but um, I, I am uh, relatively pessimistic. I share the view this is an existential crisis. Thanks, Michael. Barbara, I'm gonna to turn to you. Um, to, and shift this question slightly for some of your comments, and I know some of the things that, that you care about most deeply, because if we, are, um, if we are concerned about a gender lens here, many of the most vulnerable MFIs are the ones who are more likely to be serving women, uh, are going to be smaller, are easier to overlook. Um, you know, as Michael was just referencing, uh, if you view this as a, as a two-month problem, uh, you react differently. Um, I, I already have some concerns that what's something that we're not seeing yet, but that we could start seeing, particularly among women, is selling their productive assets in order to put 
uh, food on the table for their families. Uh, you know, the, the, a lot of the genesis of the global microfinance movement was how do we actually get productive assets in the hands of these women? Uh, and they are likely to be the first ones to turn to selling those assets um, to continue to feed their families. Um, would you, um, Barbara, I see you're still on mute. I'm gonna unmute you. Um, okay, don't, don't unvideo me though, please. <laughs> I'm not going to unvideo you. Uh, yes, that I don't do. Um, so uh, thoughts there, Barbara, on the situation in Latin America and on, on the particular gender lens here? Yeah, um, I, I agree with you. I had made a comment earlier because I think women are, at least what I'm seeing is like especially concerned about the health uh, ramifications of this. And so they are locking down a little bit more um, and being more cautious uh, even before, you know, the government in some cases. And so they are going to start seeing this hit their income more quickly. And they may be making decisions that are more about, yeah, feeding the family, staying home, um, that aren't going to help them be more productive. So that's definitely a concern that I have on women um, and that they're less digital, they're less uh, accessible without face-to-face -face communication. So how do, you, how do you reach them? How do you get money in their hands, even if it is sort of more like a cash transfer type money rather than, than loans? Um, it's a real issue. One thing I'll say in Latin America that I've been really encouraged by, um, and this is kind of following on a trend I've seen over the last few years where there's a lot more customer centric kind of um, sensitivity around what customers need and being close to your customers. I think people sort of learn their lesson um, over in the last financial crisis and like when you don't have good communication and trust with your customer, what might happen. And so there is a little bit more emphasis on that. And what I'm seeing a lot of MFIs doing now is, is talking to their customers. So the first step is verifying they have the right phone numbers. And in many cases they don't. And that's something that's always been very difficult. Um, but now they're really trying hard to get those phone numbers um, to the extent that they're even mobilizing some loan officers kind of cautiously um, to try to get those phone numbers. So um, there are some loan officers out in the field working on things like repayment and working on um, getting phone numbers in countries where there isn't like a total lockdown. Um, those phone numbers are going to be really, really important if this ends up dragging out because they'll allow communication, but then they'll also allow maybe some sort of channel for other types of um, services that might be available in the future. So that's my silver lining, I think. So Graham, uh, you're you're still on as a panelist. I saw your comment in in the chat that um, we are likely to see the shutdown of uh, of many organizations here, um, the ones that uh, don't have access uh, to international funding. Uh, I, I want to you know, Graham, feel free to sort of comment here and, and reiterate what you were saying mm -hmm. as well. But I want to throw that conversation to sort of the broader group of. Um, are we at the point where we need to start thinking about triage uh, in the medical sense that there are institutions that we may highly value but are not savable uh, and be looking at uh, how we consolidate the industry in certain places so that uh, uh, those, at least the, the, the customers of those institutions are not left behind? I'll jump in. Um, that is what would happen uh, in anyone who's evaluating a workout plan. Uh, you know, if it's not viable, then people tend not to put the uh, time and, and energy into trying to save it. Uh, that may mean, though, it doesn't, as you're saying, doesn't just shut down. It means that there may be pushes for that portfolio to be moved to another institution. But that is what is a natural aspect of this what that means, and it sort of goes back to something Jonathan asked, which is who's calling the shots? Because if it's purely a financial viability decision, as opposed to social impact, uh, you might have very different views about which institutions you, you keep trying to keep moving forward and those that you shut down. And I think that's where um, it's very important for the more socially oriented uh, uh, funding uh, uh, diffy, iffy, and, and socially responsible investors to really be saying, is this purely just a financial viability test or not? Yeah, can I jump in on this as well, Tim? Yep. Go ahead, Greta. Yeah, you know, I think we are going to have to think about triaging in along very uh, multiple aspects, right? And, 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 you know, like 
Warren Buffett has famously said, when the tide goes out, you can see who's not wearing any shorts, right? And I think the tide is massively going out. Um, and so there are so, some institutions that aren't going to make it. I think what we have to do is try to focus on institutions that can make it. Uh, and this is, we haven't really talked as much about the regional aspect of this, but I think this is going to, the region that concerns me the most is Africa, actually, where it's a much newer um, microfinance sector. They're skating closer to the line. Um, there's not as much international investment in it, but we, we really need to think about how we're going to protect some of the MFIs in, in that part of the world. And of course, you're dealing with 54 different regulators and you know a, a much more complex set of, of challenges. And so I think we're not only gonna have to triage by type of institution, we're gonna have to triage a little bit geographically. And, and I think the other thing just to add on to what Deborah was saying is, you know, we really need to think of, of lines of defense here, right? So, you know, the MIBs are already moving pretty quickly because they can, but they're not gonna be able to hold out indefinitely. We're seeing DFIs starting to mobilize resources, and that's going to be really important. The big DFIs are going to need to come in. But behind that, we've got to really start mobilizing the donor community. And the fact of the matter is, you know, I think the muscles have all atrophied a little bit because everybody's been ch chasing shiny objects in digital finance. And let's not forget, you know, it's not just MFIs, it's the Google, you know, the off-grid um, companies, it's the digital lenders. And so I, I think we are going to need to think about mobilizing some donor support for some of this and, and you know, some World Bank and government support as well. And, and as has been pointed out by others, getting their attention is really difficult because they have so many other challenges to face. And the thing that we haven't really touched on here is, you know, sovereign and corporate debt levels were really high going into this crisis. So fiscal headroom is really limited. And so we are going to have to think about triaging with that kind of resource too, because there's just, it, you know, everybody's looking at G to P solutions. They're looking at keeping businesses afloat. And so we are going to have to think really carefully how to place those scarce resources in, in these sort of different levels of defense, because there's going to be falls on every line of defense. And, and we need to get organized. If I can, right now. If I can pick up on that. I completely think we're in the mode of triage right now. Uh, there's no question um, uh, we're doing this. I think all investors are, are, are doing this. We, we have a couple different hats. First, we're an investor, but we're also a technical assistance provider. And, and I think we're working with institutions to do their, do their best to weather the storm. But I'll also pick up, up on something um, um, Greta just said. Uh, I do think some of the microfinance institutions have been through a uh, a crisis before and no, it can weather the storm, but it's been an institution or a country. It's never been a global pandemic. And just switching hats, we're, we also do a lot of um, work with early stage fintechs, and there they count their you know cash flow in the number of months that they have of, of runway. Um, on the one hand, they they tend to be smart and nimble and much more um, much more digital. On the other hand, I don't think they've ever been through. Most of them have never been through anything like this, and so. I, I do think fundamentally triage is happening right now. Um, so, it, you know, I, I'm not an economist, but I play one on webinars. Um, it, it does, you, we are really looking at a collective action problem, I see in, in various dimensions. Um, one is uh, on the regulator side. Uh, how do we get um, uh, the MFI industry together to uh, try to get regulators across the board to behave in similar ways. Uh, and uh, as um, I apologize, we've had so many people to, that, you know, to recognize the importance of uh, the microfinance sector and not ignore it. Uh, how do we get the investors, uh, the DFIs, uh, the MIVs um, to act and not, um, uh, not be predatory potentially even? Uh, I, I said in some of my initial comments, um, uh, when the tide goes out is when you see how many social investors are actually social investors and how many were just making stuff up. Um, and, uh, you know, I think this is a real time for the social investment committee, co community to, to act like they're social investors and uh, expel those people who are not acting like social investors. Um, to the extent that, that FAI can uh, uh, be a hub for trying to solve some of these collective action problems. Um, I want to offer us up to, to do that to anybody who's on the phone and thinking about this. Um, uh, feel free to reach out, but uh, I, I want to hear in our last few minutes, think about the future of the industry, thinking about 
what might be different uh, post COVID? Uh, what should we be thinking about in the delivery of services? Do we think about uh, microfinance uh, as, a, as a delivery channel for a lot of different things because of the networks and the infrastructure, all of the people the industry has trained? Um, should we be thinking about uh, you know, a movement away from uh, group meetings and face-to-face -face interactions uh, to other things? Uh, just invite some comments from folks on you know, what, uh, what say um, September or December 2020 look like in terms of the industry. Um, Shamaran, I, can I put you on the spot to, to get us started on that? Yes, you can put me on the spot. I don't know if I've thought that far ahead yet. Um, yeah, obviously things will change. I mean, things are changing already, Tim. I mean, some of those things like group meetings and face-to-face, -face, I mean, all of that is slowly going away anyway. It might just, might just speed things up, uh, maybe speed up, you know, the move to digital more quickly. I mean, maybe MFIs will realize that that needs to happen more quickly. Uh, yes, we've also been thinking about how we can use the MFI distribution network to, to, to potentially provide a lot more uh, more types of financial services, even non-financial services. So all of that, yes, we could we could look at that. I just wanted to make a, a, a comment, um, not just on the future, but I mean, just about this crisis itself, because I, I, I heard Michael's comments and I read uh, Graham's, and obviously I, I do not disagree that we are in a really difficult situation right now, and it will require collective action at a scale which is unprecedented. No, no doubt about that, right? Um, but I think one of the... Uh, maybe one of the benefits of being from Bangladesh and, and being probably a little bit closer to the action um, is that, you know, uh, we do face a lot of, uh, lot of crises, right? And in, in, in all of the countries that all of us work in, I mean, these things, nothing of this nature, nothing of this scale, but if you look at an individual household in any, I mean, uh, these households face a lot of these things, whether it's cyclones or earthquakes in Haiti or or, or, or droughts that last a long time that take away income for a long time. So I think one thing to keep thinking about is that our, our clients have shown amazing resilience time and time again, right? Um, and that's something we've got to bank on as, as MFIs. Um, and, and Michael, you know how the Haiti situation was for the MFIs there. I mean, we thought things were gonna get really bad, but things turned around. And similarly for us in Ebola and similarly for us after every cyclone and every flood, that happens if you look at that individual household that doesn't have income for six weeks, two months, three months. I mean, poor women come back faster than you. <laughs> we give them credit for, uh, and I just wanted to say that and and keep that, you know, make sure we remember that as we're thinking about this this collective action that we definitely need to take, and and we've got to think, we've got to think that this will last a long time and it will require a lot of lot of work. Um, I have just looked down at the clock. <laughs> and seeing where we are. I think there is a lot to, to continue this conversation. Um, but, uh, you know, to Shamaran's last comments, Stuart, um, I want to offer a, a parting comment to you in thinking about, you know, what this really means for these households that you spent uh, a lifetime sort of getting to know, uh, coping in, in some of the most difficult circumstances. Um, if you were to, you know, we still have about 300 people on the line listening to this. Um, if you were to offer a few thoughts on what you would want everyone to keep in mind as we think about what comes next, um, what would they be? Oh my goodness. Um, well, there are a bunch of general principles that I think still are valid and are in good times and in bad times, like at the moment. So the MFI industry needs to learn to appreciate the, the preferences and behavior of its clients more than it has done historically. Uh, the MFI industry has tended to want to bring its clients into a way of thinking, into a set of attitudes that suits it. Whereas I've always thought that what MFI should really be doing is finding ways of understanding the behaviors and preferences of poor people and finding ways to satisfy them in their sorts of terms. That is why I've always been um, on, on the on an extreme wing of those who say that I don't like the idea of very rigid repayment schedules because these are 
extremely difficult, especially for the poorest and the most vulnerable of our clients. And um, in, a, in, a, in the kind of shakeout that's happening at the moment, I would like to think that this will be one of the attitude shifts that takes place in the industry. And uh, I'm, without diaries, we're quite well placed to, to watch and see if this is going to happen because we're going to keep running these diaries for a lot longer yet, I hope. And uh, Bangladesh, for all that it was the pioneer of microfinance, has also been one of the countries that has retained a lot of these rigidities and has been somewhat resistant to uh, thinking of dealing with clients in a way that respects their lives more than the lives and attitudes of the financial industry. And um, so we will find out. I, I like a previous speaker, uh, like Chamaron was saying, um, I think poor people are very resilient. We're seeing it now as we go through this crisis. The, my diaries will reveal in a year or so exactly perhaps what those mechanisms were that allowed them to be resilient. So if we come out of this with most of our diaries still alive and still prospering and looking forward to a future and still bringing up their kids and so on, uh, I hope that our diaries will be able to show what some of those mechanisms were that allowed them to do that. And within that, we will see very clearly what the role of the MFIs was. And at the moment, two weeks into the crisis, the MFIs have no role at all. They've all shut up shop. They're simply not there. Well, thank you for that, Stuart. Um, we are coming up on an hour and a half, and so I'm gonna wrap us up, but you know, my, my deep and heartfelt thanks um, to all of you who um, are panelists who have joined to the many who uh, have listened in on this. I know we didn't get a chance to address um, a, a great deal of the questions as I expected we would not. Um, you, uh, as I've mentioned, there is a set of resources uh, at financialaccess.org of things that we've referenced and we're gonna update that. There have been a great number of additional resources shared in the chat during the, uh, during the course of the webinar. So we'll be adding those as a central hub. Uh, there are questions we haven't answered that I'll be following up individually with some of our panelists and other experts to try and provide answers through and, and distributing those through the, the, the five. So if you don't subscribe there, please do. Um, we will be sending out a message to everybody who registered uh, and this uh, webinar has been recorded and will be available uh, for watching on demand. So if you think there are others who uh, would benefit from hearing it, you can share the links uh, that way uh, to share it with them. Um, and you will be hearing from us as uh, we attempt to play our part in solving collective action problems. Um, there uh, is a lot to do, um, and so much so that it can be daunting. Um, you know, I occasionally make jokes that sometimes it feels like getting out of bed in the morning is an act of heroism. Um, but uh, if we are going to get through this, if the industry is going to survive, uh, and as critical as I have been at various times of the MFI industry, I absolutely believe that the extension of financial services is critical to the health and prosperity of poor households around the world. Uh, we know that because they invent financial services for themselves and we don't provide it. Um, and uh, as Stuart was saying, uh, we need to, to watch what they're doing and adjust what we do uh, in line with what their needs are. Um, but to do that, I, we all need to be acting together. And so uh, I wanna leave you with a note of encouragement that um, please uh, do look out for opportunities to join collective action efforts on these domains. Uh, please raise your voice. Uh, to regulators, to investors, uh, to governments, uh, to donors, uh, wherever you can. Uh, please join in any of these efforts because that is absolutely what's going to be needed to see us to the other side and make sure that we are in a position to provide capital and support to these poor households so that they can be resilient so that um, we don't lose uh, 20 years of ground uh, that we've gained in financial inclusion globally. So thank you again so much for caring enough to spend an hour and a half of your uh, late night, uh, mid-afternoon, or early morning with us. Uh, thank you so much to, to Stuart and Shamran for joining us so late, for Neville for joining us early, uh, for all of those, uh, Deborah, for Michael for jumping in uh, just at the end there, for uh, Barbara and Graham for adding your comments. Um, there, I am now convinced there will be another one of those, of these five lives uh, to delve more into the operational issues, um, because I think those are gonna be the, a lot of the big questions coming up now is, uh, what do we do for lo loan officers and staff? 
how do we adjust the products? What do we do about interest accumulation? Um, how do we keep the doors open? How do we uh, transition to some digital services? Those sorts of things. And so we'll be looking at uh, addressing some of those as well. So uh, with that, I'm going to wrap us up. Thank you again to all of our panelists and to the uh, uh, 300 plus people who, who listened in and we'll look forward to being in touch uh, and to uh, the future of the MFI uh, industry globally. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you.